The Time Machine Did It by John Swartzwelder, Chapter 3. Every detective has his own methods for solving a case, but for me it's mostly just legwork. When I first became a detective, I had tried solving crimes the way mystery writers do, coming up with a solution to the crime first, then working back to the point where you don't know what the hell is going on. But for some reason, every time I tried that, I ended up locked in a closet. So now, I just solve crimes the old-fashioned way. I walk there. The first person I went to see was a fence I knew named Frank. Frank the Fence, we used to call him. Then we'd laugh a little, because there were two F's in there. He never got the humor of it. It was easier to track him down than usual, because instead of operating out of a dimly lit back room somewhere, or from a slowly moving automobile... He had a big neon sign over his downtown showroom that said, Frank's Fencing Service. We pay cash for stolen merchandise. That seemed a bit brazen to me, but I guessed that he knew what he was doing, and the cops didn't. I walked in, waited while Frank haggled with a bank robber over the value of a teller's window. Then I asked Frank if he had handled any worthless figurines lately. He asked me how stupid I thought he was. I told him, and we stared at each other for a while. Then he checked out the back. Just these, he said. He had a couple of Maltese Falcons, but that was about all. I thanked him for his time, reminded him that trafficking in stolen goods was illegal, wiped his spit from my eye, then went on my way. Then I checked the pawn shops around town. Stolen merchandise often ends up in such places, despite the laws that discourage that but the results I got were invariably disappointing. I would describe what I was looking for. They would listen, nod, then excitedly show me some second-hand luggage and mirskan pipes. I got the feeling they were more interested in making a sale than helping me out. It's a sad commentary on something. Money, money, money. When will we ever learn? During my visits to the pawn shops, I noticed a lot of valuable merchandise was circulating around the city these days. A lot more than normal. Every shop seemed to be loaded with rare coins, old paintings, and all kinds of valuable collectibles. I asked the proprietors where all the good stuff came from, and they got real excited and tried to sell me that luggage again, so I left. I don't want any luggage. I thought I had made that clear. Even though Mandible had told me that his missing figurine had no intrinsic value, I thought I should check that out. So I went to several art galleries and showed the proprietors the picture Mandible had given me. They all made the same raspberry sound I had made so that settled that. I also made discreet inquiries about Mandible himself. It's important to know if your client has been telling you the whole truth, because one of the things he's been telling you is that he's going to pay you. So I checked out his story. I got the same answer everywhere I went. People had seen Mandible around, but nobody could remember him ever being rich. He had always just seemed like a tramp to them. I decided I'd better take a look at the house he said he'd lived in, he said it was called Mandible Manor, and it was on top of the biggest hill in town. That should be easy to find, I thought confidently, even for a detective of my caliber. I got in my car and drove up there. The gate didn't say Mandible Manor. It said Pelagra Place. And it looked like the name it given had been on the gate for a long time. I was familiar with the Pelagra crime family, strictly minor leaguers, I had always thought. But that didn't fit w with what I was seeing here. I knocked on the door and asked to see the head of the house. The butler looked me over in that snooty way butlers have, put his gun away, and told me to wait. A few minutes later, Big Al Pelagra came to the door and asked what I wanted. I told him what Mandible had told me. Pelagra frowned. He said he had never heard of a guy by that name, and, more than that, he had never heard of me either. This guy had never heard of anybody. He said his family had always owned this place. Everybody knew that, and I should get lost. I agree I probably should. It would be best for everybody. I went back to see Mandible at the address he had given me. It wasn't so much of an address as a couple of cross streets. I found him sitting in a gutter accosting passers-by. Spare change, peasant? Oh, it's you, Burley. Have you found out anything? Do you have a theory? Yes, I'm working on the theory that you're a nut. I not only haven't found your figurine, I'm beginning to doubt there ever was one. I think that figurine of yours is one of those things people have in their minds, but it isn't anywhere else. And I've been checking around about you, too. 
Nobody in town ever heard of you being anything but a tramp. Some added descriptive adjectives, like stinky. Then I told him about my visit to Mandible Manor, and how I discovered that it was actually named Pelagra Place, and had been named that since it was built sixty years ago. Mandible got pretty angry at this. I specifically told you to confine your investigations to the figurine. You've exceeded your authority, disobeyed instructions, violated confidences. Well, I'm sorry. You'll be sorrier still if you disobey my instructions again. Now get back to work, and make sure you follow my orders to the letter this time. If it's all the same to you, I think I'll just resign from this case. I don't need your money that much, especially since it's so imaginary. His tone changed immediately. You can't quit. I need you. No one else will help me because I have no money to offer them, and my story is so preposterous. You're my only chance. I need help. My family needs help. He jerked a thumb back over his shoulder. I saw a group of snooty-looking tramps eyeing me coldly. My daughter used to be the number six ranked deb debutante in the city, he said. She was fondled by presidents. Now she counts herself lucky when she gets slobbered on by a garbage man. If you won't continue on this case for my sake, do it for hers. I looked over at his daughter. She gave me the finger. I didn't really feel like doing anything for this family. I told Mandible so. He couldn't believe it. It was the most amazing thing he'd ever heard, the most astounding thing anyone had ever said. He couldn't believe he had heard me right. I told him he had. Now he couldn't believe that. This guy was making me tired. Thanks for the afternoon's entertainment, I said. I'll flush a copy of my bill down the toilet. You should be getting it in a couple of days. I left. Behind me I could hear the protesting mandible taking out his fury on a nearby dog turd. I started heading for home. I had decided to call this case the Case of the Lying Tramp. Halfway down the street, I spotted a small-time crook I knew named Small-Time Charlie. He was walking down the street carrying a briefcase. I wondered about this because criminals do not generally carry briefcases. It doesn't match the rest of their costume. I wonder if this was some new fad, like when criminals briefly went to, went to, <laughs> went to the see-through mask. While I was watching him, he looked around to make sure no one was watching him, then ducked into a telephone booth. It shimmered for a second, and went out of focus, then returned to normal. The door opened and a small-time Charlie came out. He was carrying a bag stuffed with money, and had a Van Gogh under his arm. He looked around to make sure he still wasn't being observed, then hurried down the street. This got me curious. Small-time Charlie had gotten his name from the small crimes he specialized in. A big day for him was when he stole enough to stay alive. He had started out stealing things from people's garbage cans and then hiding them in the dump. He stopped doing it when the city started paying him for it. Seeing him making big scores like this was intriguing to me, so I followed him. I kept about a block or so behind him, all the way to the seedy hotel where he lived, gave him a couple minutes to drag the loot up to his room, then followed him up and knocked on the door. Nobody home, he called. I thought about this. Then who was talking to me? The answering machine. Beat it, Burley. The hinges on those old hotel doors are no match for the old Burley shove. I forced open the door and ambled in. Hi, Charlie. I was in the neighborhood, and I thought I'd drop by and nose around your home, see what I could find. He was hanging up the Van Gogh next to the print of dogs cheating at cards. You can't just barge into people's happy hotel rooms like this. I got rights. I know. I just want to see what else you've got. I gave the place the old burly... <laughs> I gave the place the old burly once-over. It was obvious that Charlie had been doing very well since I saw him last. His cheap room was filled with valuable antiques and bales of cash. There were fancy paintings on the wall. I looked closer at one of them. It showed an old, old lady sitting in a chair. Did you paint this? I asked. Because it's good. Yeah, I painted it last night. So what? Get out of here. You ain't invited to as many places as you show up. There was a brass plate attached to the frame that said Whistler's Mother. Wait a minute, I said. This is Whistler's Mother. Used to be, maybe. It's my mother now. Along with the paintings, there were also a number of diplomas on the walls from major universities issued in the name of Professor Groggins, which Charlie informed me was his nom de collage the name he used when he graduated from colleges. 
It surprised me to find out that he was a learned man. I sat down on a small stack of gold bars and looked through some photo albums he had on the coffee table. These pictures of you? Sure, he said. Why, don't they look like me? Not really. They look more like an older, taller, different man. He glanced at the pictures. Those were taken back when I was different. That didn't make sense, but it followed. I put the photo album down. Where'd you get all this money all of a sudden, Charlie? And if you got so much money, why are you still living in this dump? What do you mean? This is a great room. What's wrong with it? It's great. He looked around the room, suddenly not sure. I kept questioning him for a while, but I wasn't getting anywhere. He had an answer for everything, even if most of the answers were none of your business, Burley, or you already asked that, stupid. So I decided to cuff him around a little and see if he would shake any if that would shake any information loose. It's said that the first person who raises a hand in violence is the person who's run out of ideas. That's usually me. I run out of ideas fast. Violence I've got plenty of. While I was shaking him, I threatened the call to police if I didn't get some answers that were more useful and less insulting to me personally. Go ahead and call them, he said. I don't care. In fact, I'll call them myself. He shook himself loose from my grasp, picked up the phone, and called the police. I confess this maneuver surprised me. I wasn't sure what my next move should be, so I pretended to look at some of the paintings on the walls, making what I hoped were intelligent-sounding comments. Five minutes later, the cops arrived, listened to my story, then invited us both downtown to sort the matter out there, where they had better lighting and more ways to make people talk. <laughs>